Attention crew, this is your Captain Caliban speaking. This is a supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals, where we bring you news and tidbits from the world of Trek, also interviews with special guests, and a few little surprises along the way. This week, we'll take another look at the turbulent world of Star Trek Discovery. We'll feature some intriguing Trek news stories from around the web, including a story or two featuring our neighbors to the north, Canada. And with that, commençons! Well, let's talk good news before bad as it pertains to Star Trek Discovery. The good news is that the looming Hollywood writers' strike has been averted, with the Writers Guild of America reaching a tentative agreement with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, or AMPTP. The deal now goes to the WGA board and council for approval and to the Guild's members for ratification. A summary of the benefits won by the Writers Guild follows... An increase in minimums across the board, increases to the health plan and an expansion of protections in options and exclusivity. The definition of the standard amount of work which is defined for an episode has been set for the first time at 2.4 weeks of work per episode. I believe this was in response to the fact that many cable networks have been releasing shorter than average seasons, and I assume they're working their writers as if the seasons were longer. Now any work past the 2.4 week average will require extra compensation. The WGA also won a 15% pay increase in pay TV residuals, $15 million in increases for high-budget streaming VOD residuals and comedy variety writers on pay TV, and job protection for parental leave. In all, the WGA said the deal will net the Guild's members, quote, $130 million more over the life of the contract, end quote. And this is great news for writers. I'm not sure how the AMPTP is taking it, but I'm, I'm sure they can handle it. And it means for you that there won't be any stoppage in the development of Star Trek Discovery. At least none as far as the writers are concerned. <clears throat> as for the rest of the production, it's anybody's guess at this point. From today's news about what the heck is actually going on in Toronto, actor Shazad Latif, who was previously playing Klingon Commander Cole, has now been recast in the role of Lieutenant Tyler, a, quote, Starfleet officer in the Federation, end quote. Yeah. And, oh, and he wears shoes, so I feel like I know everything about him. Uh, the role of Cole has gone to Kenneth Mitchell. In more casting news, Discovery has added three additional actors. Rika Sharma as Commander Landry, the security officer of the Discovery. Claire McConnell as Dennis, a Klingon leader. And Damon Runyon as Ujili, another Klingon leader. Mm -hmm. There are more cast members than filmed pages, it seems, at this point. And although it's cool to have some new talented actors aboard, the question or questions remain. What is going on up there and when are we going to see this show? Theory. Here's my unfounded theory. I know things like this are written and they're and they're coordinated well in advance of release, you know, even shooting. Um, we know Brian Fuller, before departing the show, penned or helped pen the the first two episodes scripts. Someone close to the production that I know, who I'm not going to name because I can't remember if I promised them that I wouldn't say anything or not, but uh, I'm not even going to say that much. It doesn't matter. This person has read those scripts and says they're good. So why aren't we hearing about a release date or that this is in the can or it's on to post-production? We're seeing ads, commercials, trailers, so on and so forth. I think, and I know that with Fuller leaving, he's left Berg and Harberts, his frequent collaborators, to run the show, but I think the production is working as hard as it can to de-Fuller the entire show. When you have someone who's a showrunner and an executive producer and the head or, or at least a staff writer like Brian Fuller was, that's his show. Like his stink is all over it. And Brian Fuller, if I may say so, is a guy with a lot of stink. He's a distinctive maker of television. You know a Brian Fuller show when you're watching it. Now that he's gone and Alex Kurtzman, Mr. Star Trek Into Darkness himself, is on board as EP, I think there's a lot of big changes that are going on in the production. And... Depending on how you feel about Into Darkness, they may not be good changes. <sighs> More on this as it fails to develop. Speaking of potential disappointments, the heavily rumored Star Trek IV, that is the Kelvinverse, JJ-verse, Star Trek IV, may not be a sure thing. Yes, Simon Pegg has hinted that he's working on the script. Yes, Chris Hemsworth says the pitch for the film is 
amazing. But the somewhat tepid box office of the last film in the series doesn't necessarily guarantee a new film. Zachary Quinto, who plays Spock in the new film series, said as much in a recent appearance on the Today Show to promote his new film, Aardvark. When questioned about the status of the fourth film, he said that he knows the script is being worked on and that, quote, I'm hoping to do one, but there's no guarantees, end quote. I'd push caution when looking into this. Remember that Quinto's not involved in any part of the film's development. He just gets a call when it's time to get another bowl cut. So to me, he just looks like a guy trying to promote his indie movie. And then Al Roker asks him a question about Star Trek with 10 seconds left in the segment on this morning show. So nothing about this is definitive. Paramount needs successes right now as a studio, even mild successes. So I'm sure we'll see the old new crew back again with Justin Lin directing soon. Wow, I can't believe I'm pulling for another Kelvinverse movie. This is truly the darkest timeline. Speaking of timelines, time travel has always been a staple of storytelling in the Star Trek franchise, and StarTrek.com recently asked its readers to pick the best time travel episode of any Trek series, or at least from the following selections. All Good Things, The City on the Edge of Forever, Endgame, Little Green Men, Past Tense 1 and 2, Stormfront, Time Zero 1 and 2, Tomorrow's Yesterday, Trials and Tribulations, and Yesterday's Enterprise. And the winner, The City on the Edge of Forever, with 25% of the vote, and Trials and Tribulations and Yesterday's Enterprise tied for second with 19% each. Stormfront came in last with 2% of the vote. Stay strong, Enterprise fans. And stay tuned, listeners, for a little show-related announcement about Trekdom's favorite time travel episode. Tease. Oh, Canada, gentle constitutional monarchy to the north. Your countryside is beautiful. Your populace is civil. Your health care socialized. You're like the Federation with more moose and way less synthahol. You're like a stylish but understated hat worn by a juggalo. And you are full of Star Trek fans who don't always get their due. Hell, James Kirk isn't from Iowa. He's from Montreal. And so we dedicate these stories to you. Mick Troller of Winnipeg, Manitoba is a Trek fan, so much so that for the last two years, he's had a personalized license plate on his Ford Explorer that features a catchphrase from one of his favorite Star Trek villains. But Troller received a phone call last week from his insurance company saying they'd received complaints that the plate was offensive and would have to be surrendered. What does it say on the plate? Assimilate. Troller's license plate is housed in a Borg-themed plate holder, which reads, We are the Borg, and resistance is futile. But according to Manitoba Public Insurance's policy, which reads, Quote, plates cannot contain a slogan that could be considered offensive, end quote. Troller must return the plate for a free replacement or choose to receive a refund of his $100 license fee. That's in Canadian dollars. Troller says he means no harm by the plate, saying it's funny, and he met other Trek fans who've wanted their picture taken with it. But that word assimilate has deeper connotations for a country that has, in the past, forced cultural assimilation on indigenous peoples. Says Troller, quote, We've become way too sensitive. You can't say anything anymore to anybody, end quote. And the editorial portion goes here. Yeah, but are you interested in offending people unintentionally? I mean, I know your last name is Troller, but is it a question of intention or one of sensitivity? No word on whether Troller will take the $100 Canadian or order a plate reading Enterprise D's Nuts. Letters in Canada can now go where no mail has gone before. Please, please don't turn off the podcast just yet. Last Friday, Canada Post released a collection of seven commemorative Star Trek stamps featuring the captains from each of the five televised Star Trek series. Each stamp features the captain in question as well as an image of one of their chief nemeses. No, not not Star Trek Nemesis. This is Nemesis. A sixth stamp features the Galileo shuttlecraft, which appeared in the original series, and the seventh stamp features a foil hologram Borg cube. The Galileo and Borg one are cool, but I think they missed the boat on not having an animated series one, like a little Mares stamp, maybe the Kazinti in the background. And they should have totally had a stamp with Sinequa Martin Green as Lieutenant Commander Michael Burnham. But we all know Discovery's got its own problems outside of trying to get a stamp together. And of course, the nemesis in the background would be the CBSI? Less Moonvis. That's no moon. It's a Moonvis. And to complete our hat trick of Canada themed material, hat, hat trick? It's a, it's a hockey term. Okay. 
<clears throat> our top comment this week from our social media comes from Parlon Trek at at Parlon Trek. That's P-A-R-L-O-N-S-T-R-E-K on Twitter. We tweeted out a reminder that listeners of the show could be entered to win a Star Trek Trivial Pursuit set if they left us a review on iTunes. And one of the admonishments in the tweet was Kabla, the Klingon word for success. But the sharp-eyed Parlon Trek has an even sharper sense of proper alien orthography and tweeted back to us, quote, no H in Kabla. Smiley face, hashtag grammar warrior, end quote. You are correct, PT, my mistake. I uh, took remedial Klingon in school. Although I will say that as far as the Klingon language goes, I have an announcement I'll be making very soon on the show about a Klingon-related event. And yes, that's vague booking. And no, I don't know how to say vague booking in Klingon, so just deal. I'm going to once again break the prime directive of podcasting, that is, don't send your listeners to another podcast, but Parlon Trek is not just a fancy name, they are a Trek podcast themselves, and therefore, as you can probably guess, francophones. I'll just read you their show description from iTunes via Google Translate. <clears throat> Parlon Trek is broadcast live every Thursday on the web radio of Maximum Power and offers you one hour dedicated entirely to your favorite franchise. JP, Mark, and their collaborators will share with you the latest developments concerning the universe of Star Trek and will introduce you to this universe that has been passionate about trekking for 50 years. So, thank you for your comment, JP, Mark, and the people at Parlon Trek, and for keeping us honest, or honorable, as the case may be. If you do speak French, give their show a try. At the very least, you'll be getting the correct pronunciation of Jean Luck Pickard. Your prize for the top comment is a year's supply of Mexican bacon. Go ahead. See how the other half lives. Remember, listeners, you can join in on the conversation and maybe have your comment read on the air. Just go to facebook.com forward slash EIST pod or find us at EIST pod on Twitter or through our social media links on enterprisingindividuals.com. You can also reach the show at EIST pod at gmail.com with feedback and suggestions or to just say hello. We're waiting to receive your transmission. I'd also like to direct your attention to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. We work hard to bring you an entertaining and informative show every week. And if this was the 24th century where money didn't exist, we would do it merely for the sense of satisfaction. But this is the 21st century and everything costs something, it seems. So if you enjoy the show and want to help out, please check out our Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. We have many tiers or ranks at which you can contribute with different benefits and prizes you can receive. Receive, in addition to knowing that you are contributing to something you love and are part of a larger community, anything you can contribute would be appreciated and would help keep us flying. And we even take Canadian dollars. And that's it for this supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals. If you're an iTunes listener and you haven't yet, why not look us up on iTunes? Make sure you're subscribed to the show. Also, write a little review if the spirit moves you and, and give us a rating at the very least. We'd appreciate it. If you're not on iTunes, you can still subscribe to the show on Google Play or Stitcher or wherever you get our show from. And if you leave positive comments and ratings on those platforms as well, we'd be eternally grateful. Two weeks ago, I announced our giveaway of a Star Trek Trivial Pursuit set for a lucky iTunes commenter, and I jumped the phaser a little bit as we have been a little too busy around home base to get all the entries in and, in fact, order the prize. <clears throat> so we are extending the contest another two weeks, and the winner will be announced on the May 17th supplemental show. So you still have time to enter. Leave enterprising individuals a rating and review on iTunes, and you'll be entered into a drawing for a chance to win a set of Star Trek Trivial Pursuit cards Anniversary Edition, special Galileo Shuttlecraft holder included. Last chance for, you know, you know, two weeks. So make it so. Next time on Enterprising Individuals. In a feat of timing so precise it would take the Guardian of Forever to orchestrate it, we present to you a thoughtful examination of Star Trek fandom's most beloved time travel episode, The City on the Edge of Forever. Author Kevin Lauderdale joins us for a discussion of the trickiness of Cordrazine, the fickleness of Harlan Ellison, and why the universe hates Joan Collins so much. Next time on the show, The City on the Edge of Forever. And until then, I'm your Captain Caliban, signing off and saying live long and prosper. Prosper.